Dr. Joe Vitale, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I'm absolutely beside myself with excitement at having you on board. Um, as we spoke of, offline, I mean, we have a relationship that goes back many, many years. Um, and you've done so much in that time and so much out of that time as well. How do you fit it all in? <laughs> you know, everybody asked me that. How do I write so many books? I have 80 books out. Wow. I am a musician with 15 albums out. I have more courses and digital products and coaching and mentoring programs that I can keep track of. But here's the secret. I don't do it all at once. Mm. If you do something every day, mm. over time, you end up with a library. I'm 66 years old. My first book was in 1984. When my first book came out, I thought, I got a book. I never knew I would write 80 books. No. But as you keep following the thread, you keep doing the work. Every day passes and you've been prolific and you've been productive. You stop at the later age, you turn around and you go, wow, look what I did. So I don't do it all in one day. It's over time. Yeah. And I guess that if you think of your, even if you thought to yourself back then, I want to write 80 books, it would have been too daunting, right? It would have been overwhelming. It would have been unbelievable with a person with one book under my belt. It took a long time for that book to get published. I would have thought it's not possible. Um, I'm not even sure I thought about a second book at that point. So to, to look at 80 at this point, it's like, you know, it's like everything else in life. You just do what you need to do this day. Mm. Tomorrow you do what that day requires. The next day you do what that day requires. And as long as you keep focused on your passion and you're being prolific and you're being productive at a certain point later on, other people will probably tell you before you even notice They'll say, wow, how did you write 80 books? Or how did you appear in 15 movies? Or how did you do blah, blah, blah? And then you can stammer and stutter and think of a good answer. <laughs> yeah, or just roll your eyes or whatever comes to yeah. mind. Hey, I'm just doing my thing. Absolutely. Now, look, the, one of the reasons that we're here today, um, uh, there are many reasons, but, but one of the big ones is because you have a new book out. Yeah. Um, it's a fabulous you. book. Uh, I've gone through it. I've read it. Um, and do you know what I like about it? this book in particular, but your books in general. Um, and this is, we have a few things in common. I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware of them, but, but I'll let you know what they are. One of them is our love of old metaphysical classic books, if you like, oh. from the old teachers, you know, the, the Wallace yeah. Bottles, the yeah. uh, Neville Goddards. It was, it was you actually who put me onto Neville all those years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. Arnold Patton is another one who, who is a little oh, bit God, contemporary, yes. but, but you write in a very, very similar way. Is that because mm -hmm. you're, um, dare I say, obsessed with that kind of book or a fan of that kind of <laughs> way of writing? That's an interesting question. I'm obsessed with those books, uh, the metaphysics of the past from the 1800s, from the early 1900s, absolutely fascinates me. It's like lost wisdom that's still mm -hmm. available if you find the book and you yeah. dig into it. I don't think I'm trying to model their writing style because some of it wasn't the clearest and some of it was dated and coming from the 1800s, they used the male dominant language and they didn't always tell stories. So I have to balance your question with this kind of an answer. Yes, I love metaphysics, but I love old marketing books. I love old copywriting books. I love old bodybuilding books. I love old books. Yeah. But my writing style is what I coined way back in the 90s as hypnotic writing. Right. And hypnotic writing is a blend of fictionalized storytelling and factual copywriting. Right. You put those two together and now you have something compelling and something different. And what I try to do with everything, including the new book, is tell stories in a compelling way to convince people, persuade people, inspire people, influence people to do something different in almost every case, to go for their dreams. In this particular case, to go for their dreams of having more money so they can fulfill their life mission. So, yeah, I love books, and I, I long to write books that'll be, God, I hope that they last way beyond me, and they become classics of literature, but I'm trying to write hypnotic stories that'll make a difference. Now, do you going back to those early days, you did, you, you did work as a copywriter, is that correct? Early on, yes, and uh, I didn't even know what copywriting was for the longest time. And in the early 1990s, probably even the late 1980s, when I was struggling and I was unknown and I did have a book published, but it didn't really go anywhere, I learned about copywriting as a way to make money from writing. 
Right. And copywriting is when you write sales letters and ads and news releases and all of this. I ended up actually being captivated by it. I was just so in awe that it's the art of writing something to a stranger mm. to sell the stranger on something they have to buy now and they may get later and they may or may not like. I mean, it was just, just an overwhelming challenge to be a copywriter and to write something that would convince people to part with their money. But I found that first I seemed to be fairly good at it. And I still remember those early days when I would send out through snail mail, the old way of doing things, a sales letter that I wrote as a copywriter. And then I would receive a check. It was like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and giving you the fuel to carry on another day, right? Right, right. You know, and the enthusiasm and the motivation. I still remember opening my mailbox, opening it up, and there inside I pulled out the envelope, but it was like, it worked. It worked. <laughs> copywriting works. So I still love copywriting, but I try to apply the copywriting method of communication right. to my books, like Money Love Speed. Because I'm trying to sell people, not on buying something, but on buying an idea. Yeah. And the idea is money's neutral, money's good, money is a force of spirituality to help your dream. So if I can convince people of that, they will have a better life and that will ultimately make a better planet. This might be a, a, a bit of a blase question, but I'm interested, you know, why do so many people have such a problem around this concept of earning more money? You know, oh, quite a few yeah. of your books are on about creating abundance. And, you know, you, uh, I'm sure we can agree, you know, it's a fabulous time to live right now. The, the, the ability yeah. for us to become prosperous has right. never been easier, easier. Um, right. But people still are caught up in this old paradigm of money. Yeah. Well, that's a reason that I wrote this book, Money Loves Speed. Uh, I was homeless at one point, as I'm sure you know. And I was in poverty for 10 years. That was not a picnic. No. And I was married at the time, so we really struggled and went through the dark night of the soul, which lasted ten, a decade, which is amazing. And I was doing the right things. I was reading the success literature. I was applying myself every day. I was trying to write my books. I was writing books, but nobody was buying. And I kept wondering, what is the block? What, is, what am I doing wrong? And here's what I'm doing wrong or was doing wrong. And here's what most people are doing wrong. A, they still think money's bad. Money is the root of all, everybody just said evil. Everybody on your podcast just said evil. So stop and think, if you think money is evil and you're trying to attract money, won't you stop it? You don't want evil in your house. So you're going to do everything in your power to keep money away because you still think it's bad. Part of what I'm doing in my work, and especially in the new book, is to blow the whistle on that. And to teach people that, first of all, the quote, even if we, we don't even know how accurate it is from thousands of years ago and then translated and retranslated and reinterpreted. But as far as we know, it came from a longer quote. The love of money is the root of all evil. That's a little better. But what I have found is that the people who are okay with money don't love money. They appreciate it. Mm. They leverage it. They use it. But they're not in love with it. You mentioned Arnold Patton, who's uh, he's still around. He's in his 90s. And he once said that, and I dedicated the book to him. I've got his quote in the front of the book. Um, the sole purpose of money, the sole purpose of money is to express appreciation. Mm. If we just, if your people right now, if they just embrace that, they will dilute the block to having money when they realize that money is just a force for good, it's actually a spiritual tool, it's all neutral by itself, but the sole purpose of money is to express appreciation, that war that people have inside themselves will be over, and they will be able to receive money from the things that they do, and hopefully following their passion and making a difference in the world. So to answer your question, that's the first level, is they have beliefs about money. The second level is they have beliefs about deservingness. Yeah. Most people don't feel they deserve good things. Most people feel like they're not good enough. Most people feel like they are lacking or unlovable or unlikable in some way, shape, or form. That's where a lot of the inner work has to be done. When we know that money is a tool for good and we know we're worth it, we got a match. Now you can receive it. Um, you have a quote yourself in the book that's, that goes, money doesn't have any beliefs about you. You have beliefs yeah. about money. 
that's um, another weird that's a big yeah. quote that's a that for me that was a real i looked at that and i thought wow i would have known that 30 years ago <laughs> well me too me too you know a lot of our struggle is is that we have beliefs about money and i tell some stories in the book but my father when i was a kid said you know how to double your money fold it over and put it back in your pocket <laughs> and i thought oh my father is brilliant until I realized decades later, he was born in 1925. He was five years old when the Great Depression hit in America. He learned about scarcity in the most real, unforgettable way. And so for him, the best way to hold on to his money is to literally hold on to it and not ever let it go. And he was like that until his death at 93. And for him, it wasn't really a problem because he just learned, hey, hard work, hold on to your money, you can make it work, you can make it last. But I had an awakening and realized, wait a minute, that's a limiting thought. Mm. The opposite is true in my world, and I talk about it in the book. I say, if you really want to make more money or attract more money or receive more money, give money away. Mm. Give it away. Don't fold it over and put it in your pocket. Don't hold on to it. Share it, invest it, uh, spend it. Do all kind of wonderful things with it. One of the greatest principles for attracting money is actually the principle of giving it away. Some people in religions hear about it, and it's called tithing. Mm -hmm. And tithing has a little bit of a stink to it, because most people hear about tithing from a religion or religious person who wants you to give their, your money to them. The way that I talk about sharing in the book is you give money away but you give it to wherever you received spiritual or inspirational nourishment. Right. And that could right. be an Uber driver, a Lyft driver. It could be the guy who's running the podcast. It could be authors. It could be speakers. It could be somebody who smiled at the right time or said the right th time, said the right thing at the right time at a restaurant, wherever you receive that inspirational nourishment, that's where you give your 10% or more. It doesn't have to be a church. And with that kind of a freedom, people can realize, oh, maybe this is actually a principle of psychology and a principle of metaphysics, that the more I give, the more I will receive. So beliefs are big in this whole work. Yeah, they certainly are. And I think a lot of what you do in your book so magnificently is unravel these old beliefs, these beliefs that aren't ours, these thoughts that, that were given to us that weren't even our parents were from generations and generations and generations ago. And, you know, I, I've always likened it to, to, you have to look at where you are right now. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you don't start by looking at where you are and what you think about these things, it's going to be very, very difficult to attract, to manifest, to receive, no matter how open you are. So it, it becomes a real kind of cathartic, uh, journey you go on really healing yourself to allow yourself to receive all this abundance well i think that's what we're here to do i think life is really a process of awakening yeah one of my books is called the awakening course and in it i say there's four stages of awakening the very first one is victimhood which is virtually where everybody starts we're born yeah. into this we're downloaded all this information much like my father gave me information about struggle and scarcity but if we're lucky we see a movie like The Secret, we read a book, maybe one of mine, we see a podcast, maybe yours, and suddenly there's an aha, and we realize, wait a minute, I don't have to be a victim. I can change my beliefs. I can have more power than ever before. I can have, do, or be what I want. And there's an exhilaration there, and you've moved into the second stage, which I call empowerment. And empowerment, oh my God, you feel like Superman or Superwoman because now you just kind of visualize it and you start working for it and you, you still got to do the work, but you're co-creating it. Mm. And then it becomes magnificent. But that's only the second stage. There's a third stage of awakening. And that's when, you know, my father, he, he died last year. I'm in the middle of a divorce right now, which has not been a very pleasant experience. Had a, yellow, uh, a young relative attempt suicide, which is another mind boggling thing to go through. And then there's some other upheavals in my own life. And you get to the point where you realize, wait a minute, I'm not in charge. I don't have total control. I'm certainly more empowered than being a victim, but I'm not in charge of the universe. I'm in no. charge of my universe, but I'm not in charge of the universe. And that's when you move into the third stage and that's surrender. Right. And surrender isn't where you roll over and play dead. Surrender is where you surrender your, your will to a higher will, to what some people call 
the universe, the divine, God, we'll all have different words for this uh, higher power, if you will. And we join forces with that. And now we have miracle making potential because we've surrendered beyond our ego and joined forces with a collective. But that's not the ending either, because there's a fourth stage of awakening, which is the awakening itself, what some traditions would call enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And in that period, that's where the divine, if you will, lives and breathes and speaks through you. So all of this is to say, we got work to do. Yeah. I don't know anybody who's enlightened. I don't know anybody who's totally awakened. We're on various stages of the path. We're in various courses in this this map of consciousness, if you will. But our job is to seek and find. Seek those beliefs that are limiting us, find them, release them, so we can transcend to the next level. One of the uh, techniques that you use so successfully for releasing is Ho'oponopono. Uh, yeah. It's something that fascinated me because Zero Limits is a great book and the story behind that is incredible. Um, when I let uh, my group know, so I have a group called Creating Real Magic, um, which is a free group on Facebook and, uh, you know, um, uh, people come in, they see what you can do to create magic, um, they start creating magic in their own world. It's a fabulous place and a great community because as you say, community is so very, very important. We yeah. can't do this on our own, right? You know, yeah. um, Ho'oponopono um, it, it is a fabulous release tool, but was born about by something you discovered. Am I right by accident? Is that correct? Well, the... Um... I don't know if it was by accident, but it was probably a divine purpose and synchronicity behind it. Uh, I had a friend who told me at a convention I was at, he said, did you ever hear about the therapist who helped heal an entire ward of mentally ill criminals by doing some kind of Hawaiian healing technique, which he didn't even understand. And I dismissed the story as an urban legend. I said, oh, give me a break. I know about magic and miracles, but you can't really heal mentally ill criminals in an insane asylum hospital and not actually do traditional therapy. And so uh, I got more curious after hearing the story twice over a year and began the journey, the adventure to find that therapist, to find the social workers from the hospital and to dig into the truth. And the truth was, that was a true story. And I, I wrote it in that book that you mentioned, Zero Limits, which I'm so proud of. It's the only book that I've ever written that I've reread myself. Wow. Because it is so inspiring, it's so different, and I always felt like I kind of was a secretary to the book. It just kind of downloaded, and I just wrote it. So when I read it, there's a little bit of a sense of detachment. But the story is profound. The story is miraculous. The therapist worked on himself, and as he worked on himself, the patients around him started to heal, started to get better, and started to be released from the mental institution, which is mind-boggling. And I remember thinking, if that story is true about him doing it, and ultimately it is, then what is the potential for you and me? Mm. We don't work at an, a, a mental institution. We're not in that environment. And if that can be cured with Ho'oponopono, then what can you and I do with our lives and our challenges and the little bumps we go through uh, throughout our journey? So I've been fascinated. Yeah, and, it, and, and as you say... It, uh life is a co-creation life is also a reflection so yes. We, yes. we we become aware we see a reflection if you like of our internal state so mm -hmm. our level of awareness is a direct uh, result of of what we're thinking how we're feeling um yes. so in order to see better opportunities in order to feel better opportunity in order to have that kind of divine in intervention or the synchronicity that we speak of we have to go inside that's where we start okay. that's why something like ho'oponopono is so powerful well we have to go inside because in many ways we are the projector and the projectionist mm -hmm. and we are broadcasting the movie that we call our life and this is really advanced thinking if somebody's tuning in that listen to this for the first time it's just going to seem like the freakiest dumbest <laughs> The outer limits, twilight zone-ish, quantum physics, baffling crap that they've ever heard. But for you and me, this is reality. Mm. And so I look at my life, and sometimes it's incredibly challenging, like this past year when I mentioned about death and divorce and all mm. of these other things. I look at my life as a mirror, and the mirror is reflecting what's in me. 
Right. And this becomes total responsibility. I mean, this goes beyond what people understand as responsibility. Most people think responsibility is, I'm responsible for what I say and do. Well, you are. But at a quantum level, when you get into Ho'oponopono and into these higher states of consciousness, you realize you're responsible for everything that's showing up in your life. The people who said something you didn't like, the problem that keeps reoccurring, the outside events that are being reported by the media that look like they're totally detached from you. No, you're co-creating it. Life is a mirror and this is a big, hard thing to, to accept. But when you do, you have more power than ever before because instead of looking out there and saying, oh, I got to change him or I got to change the politics or I got to change whatever, you go, I got to change something in me. That's accessible. And it's very powerful um, it, because it gives you the power because you spoke about your, your stages of awakening, and <clears throat> the first level being victimhood. That's when you give away your power. So by right. taking it back, you are starting on the process immediately, aren't you? Which is truly magnificent. Um, well, that's why I've written this book just to, to, you know, I'm kind of plugging it again, but I want to explain what the strategy was yeah. for it. I wrote this book for victims. Okay. That's why from stress to success. I was thinking of myself from 35, 40 years ago when I was homeless and in poverty. I was thinking, what would be the thing that would have helped the Joe Vitale of back then? I'm thinking of people who are struggling right now, who, who will write and say, I got no money, I can't, I have no place to live. So the very first couple chapters in the book are immediately survival oriented. Mm. I'm not talking about stages of consciousness there. I'm talking about, hey, you need a hamburger? You need a ride, you need a roof over your head, here's numbers to call, here's websites to go to. Then once you get past survival, I move into some sort of uh, sustaining income. And I've got 35 ways for people to start attracting money. And again, I'm not talking about stages of consciousness because I know from my experience, when you're starving, you don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear it. You've got to have your belly full. You've got to have a roof over your head. And then at that point, maybe you'll listen to an opening conversation. That's when I move into stages of consciousness. That's when I move into belief work. Because I, I feel like once you move into the belief work and you do that work, and you, you and I both know how powerful that is, you change all the outer circumstances forever. So the book is kind of secretly designed to take people from victim to empowerment and beyond mm. yeah and it, it and it does that in spades i have to say um some of the strategies and some of the uh, resources you've got in there are truly amazing um so if you are struggling listening to this then then please have a look at the book because joe goes way beyond the call of duty to help you get resources to help you out of sticky situations that you may find yourself in um so so please don't be afraid to go and do that <laughs> Um, one of the biggest questions I get from people, Joe, is this um, a variation on how do I do this? But in the book, you go into great detail of why that's actually not such a great question. Do you want to go over oh, that for me quickly? I'm glad, thank you for bringing that up because that is a stumbling block for a lot of people. And I, I know when people are struggling and they are, they're broke and they're desperate, they want to know how. How do I get out of this? How do I get my house? How do I get my job? How do I get independently wealthy? How, 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 how? And I say in the book, that's the biggest mistake of all. Mm -hmm. Because when you sit here, you don't know how. No. I have some big goals, big, hairy, audacious goals I want for the, for the rest of my life, the next year, next month, and so forth. I don't know how I'm going to achieve them. And I'm chuckling because I know on the inside, I don't need to know. So here's the punchline. People like Steve Jobs said, you cannot connect the dots going forward. You can't connect them because you can't see them. You don't know what all the stepping stones are. He said you can connect the dots looking backwards. Meaning once you achieve your goal, you can sit there, you can turn around and go, oh, that step led to this step, this step led to that step, and you can explain it all. But in the beginning, when you have the goal in front of you and it just looks dark, you can't say how you're going to get there. All you have to do, though, and you know this from reading the book, is the very first baby step. Yeah. That's it. There's always an obvious, easy baby step that anybody can take right now. I always say start where your shoes are. Your shoes are right here. You're sitting right here. 
what is the very first easy step? And it could be opening up a website. It could be going to the Better Business Bureau and getting a domain name or taking a free class or writing a book or reading a book. I don't know. It's going to be different for each person. As they take that baby step, the next step becomes apparent. As they take that step, the next step becomes apparent. I think it was uh, E.L. Doctorow, the novelist, who said you can drive your car all the way across the United States at night because the headlights show about, I don't know if it's 100 feet or 100 yards, but you make that 100 feet, 100 yards, then you can make the next because it gets illuminated, then you can make the next. That's how you achieve your results. You do what's in front of you as far as you can see, and then the next part will be there. Drive that part next. Do you, do you think that sometimes it's so obvious that people miss it? They think they can't be that, that simple? Yes, I do think it's that obvious. I was actually interviewed for ABC News 10 years ago, and they made fun of me because I would answer a couple questions, and the questions to them were like so obvious. They said, doesn't everybody know this? <laughs> I would say, well, apparently not, <laughs> because they're buying my books, they're attending events, they're going to all these things. And on one level, they don't know it. We're, we're not taught in our educational system to survive and prosper and thrive. We're taught to survival-based, if anything. We're not taught the transcendence that is really needed. And so on one level, it's not available, so people don't know it. But when they hear it, it's kind of obvious. Yeah, it's kind of obvious. And, and sometimes you, I think the danger is we look back when we've, we've had a bit of success and we, we kind of kick ourselves a little bit for not seeing it sooner. But I'm just a big fan of the fact that things appear and happen when they're due to, when they're designed to. And, you know, we have to go through this wonderful journey of ups and downs, of bumps and scrapes along the way to, to get successful, to have abundance, to be It makes a great story. It well, makes a perfect story. And yeah, you know, someone such as yourself that shows it in so many wonderful places. Is that right? You went to Iran last year. Did I see that on your social media? Uh, where did you say? Rome? Iran. Iran. Oh, oh, Iran. Yeah, I was in Iran just a couple months ago. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've been all over the... Jeez. Because of my work, I've been all over the, the world. The countries I didn't even know existed. The countries I thought I would never go to, like Iran to places that are, well, you know, Russia several times, following in Italy, my gosh, so, yeah, all over the place. And for most of these people, if not all of these people, what I'm saying is brand new to them. Okay. They're like newborn babies and they're so excited, they're so inspired and there's a, there's a level of disbelief. I remember the first time I was in Poland and there was a young man in the front row and he took notes and he was there for every talk, he was there for two days. And at the end of it, he came up to me and he says, is it really true? I said, what do you mean? Is it really true that I can actually have anything I want? I can be anything I want? And he was like a, like a little baby. He was like a kitten or a puppy. And, and you were saying, yes, you can go play. Yes, you can go out and, and have a great life. Because he did not grow up hearing that. And the vast majority of people, I don't care where I'm going in these different countries, they have the same experience. And I'm bringing the keys to freedom. Oh, and bless you for As that. Are you. Well, As are you. Well, we I've try our best, right? We, we just bring the information that we know works, that we know has value, and then it's up to the people what they decide they want to do with it. Um, well, Joe, well, I, I, for you I... Because you're wearing a spiritual gangster T-shirt, it looks like. Yeah, this is exactly what I'm doing. I, I, do you know, it's funny. Um, as I said earlier on, we, we, and, I'm, and I'm mindful of the time and uh, how much value you've given. And it's been truly magnificent to have you here uh, doing what you do best and following your, your purpose and um, giving us all these lessons. But as I said at the beginning, there, there are so many things that we have in common. Um, one of them, which I just want to touch on briefly, is your strongman stuff. Um, I know you're a huge fan of the original Hercules, Steve Reeves, who was a right, magnificent right. bodybuilder back in the day, you know, yeah. in the 50s, around about that sort of time. Um, and you, is that right that you have some of his gym equipment uh, now? I have all of his equipment. Wow. <laughs> I have his universal gym that he had since the 1970s. I've got his uh, animal trainer, which was a unique device to build the upper body. Right. I have got his own weights because in later years, as he got older, he was into power walking. Right. And he had made weights to hold while he was walking. Well, I've got the Steve Reeves weights. I've got his clothes. I've got his car. He Whoa. drove a 70s 
Jag. I've got his car. I don't know. Oh, when he was 16 years old, he worked out in a neighbor's garage and he used to walk right on the wall in chalk the exercise he was doing. Right. Well, a fan of his cut that piece of the wall out. No way. Put it in a frame. I have that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So I can go on. Yeah, I'm very much into the strongman stuff. One of my earlier books, the last one before this one, was called Anything is Possible, right. which was all about strongman training, learning to bend bars and straighten horseshoes. And, you know, it's just, to me, it was further proof that the only limitations we have are mental constructs. Yeah. I still remember holding a heart horseshoe when I was in a small group of 20 some people, my first time to do this. And everybody's urging me to bend it. And I was told the, the leverage and how to think about it. And I'm holding it going, this is built for a horse. This is not supposed to bend. And yet I kept applying pressure. And when it gave, oh my God, it was like the heavens opened. And I realized nothing's impossible. If I can bend this freaking horseshoe with my bare hands, nothing is impossible. <laughs> And that's one of the reasons I, I'm so exhilarated by it. It's just another demonstration that the only limitations we have, whether we want more money or we want our you know, romance or health, are the ones up here. We want to write 80 books, be in 15 movies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, where does it stop? What's next for you, Oh, uh, What's next? Well, I, uh, wow, I'm, okay, I will go there. I am putting on a private event at the end of March in San Antonio. We're calling it the Miracles Mastermind. Wow. I only began to announce it this morning, this morning. And what I'm doing is elevating people's perception about what they think is possible. This is a three-day event. It's not the traditional speaking event where you've got people that are doing the you know, rah, 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 and there's wild yeah. music, and, uh, and you get inspired, and you take notes, and you go home, and you forget everything. No, this is the traditional mastermind where Napoleon Hill said, when you get together, you create a third mind, mm -hmm. which is a bit of an invisible but organic inspired collection of ideas that's beyond the people in the room. And so the Miracles Mastermind is an invitation to transcendence. And beyond that, we're going to be getting ideas that as we sit here, I have no idea what those are going to be because the third mind is created out of the group that's actually there yeah. at the Miracles Mastermind. Yeah. And the well, power of the collective, right? Yes, the collective. The power of the collective. Well, Joe, thank you so much for spending the last 30 minutes with us. Um, it's an absolute it. honor and a pleasure to have you here. Um, as I said, there is so much we could have spoken, so much we could have done. Um, and I know that in about three days, you'll have your next book out because you're that prolific, right? <laughs> I, I have ideas for 15 more books. So. Oh my God, I better get my, well, as we say over here, I better get my ass in gear. Um, right. Well, let me say this. Uh, I, I want everybody to know, first of all, I am grateful to be here. I am honored that you asked me to be here. Thank you. But I also personally follow you. I see your Instagram posts. I see you on Facebook. I love what you're doing. You are doing, you're doing God's work, as I like to say, and you are inspiring people. So I want to encourage you, endorse you, inspire you and tell everybody that I'm recommending this guy. Follow what he's doing. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you once again in my world for these last 30 minutes. Until next time. Until next time. <laughs>